Hey everybody, welcome back this week. So thanks again for joining me and, and spending your precious afternoon or day or night or whatever it is with you, um, with me. And um, hopefully um, this will be another constructive talk today to um, kind of continue down this path. Um, we're now eight weeks in, so almost two months now we've been designing this game together. And so this will be like 16 hours of, of actual design work on a real or what would be kind of a real product. And so, um, you know, I think we'll, we may transition next week and start something else at least for a while, and maybe we'll come back to this. Um, so today I'm going to kind of try to work on like how to sort of wrap this up at some levels. And maybe there's value. And I definitely would like to hear anybody's feedback about, you know, if they want me to keep going deeper and deeper in the same topic and keep going or, or switch into some other stuff. Maybe I'll kind of switch back and forth. I'm still kind of debating on what helps you guys the most and what, what is really interesting for everybody. And um, so, you know, this is, as you guys are probably aware now, almost over 70 hours of content on this channel. So please, you know, like and subscribe and, you know, and, and keep tabs. And if you haven't gone back and seen my other videos, please do. You know, there's, what are we at? Week 36 now. So there's 35 other videos, each a couple hours long, you know, about game design. So I really hope you appreciate that. Um, this is hard work for me. So, you know, it's definitely not easy to sit up here without any, <laughs> without any script or without any presentations and, and jabber for two hours straight, you know, on the subject. So, um, so for those of you that are new here, um, again, we've been designing a game, a superhero RPG, um, very, very quickly. So again, we're, we're kind of, we've had seven weeks, so about 14 hours into it. So if you think about it, kind of two man days and we, you know, we really haven't gotten that far into the design. You know, normally this would be something we might spend two months on or at least a couple weeks on. Um, so we're, we're kind of hyper accelerated going through this process today and you know and this whole thing and so bear with me if don't take this as like this is the way you would design in a real world we're, we're speeding things up as fast as I can to kind of try to get you guys to understand the concepts of how do you think you know and how do you think about game design right and and you know and how do you really understand systemic game design and what does that mean and for those of you that aren't aware of systemic game design please go back and watch one of my previous videos on it um, but in short, it's breaking everything down into these pieces and so that it, so the game design becomes much easier for you to, to flow and to follow because you just, one thing kind of leads to another. And um, so I'm trying to kind of show you right now in real world practice kind of how that works. So before we get started, quick um, shout outs to everybody. Jorge, um, great to see you here. Uh, we have to catch up sometime. Um, hopefully things are in Peru. Um and um, Luke, um, always a pleasure and looking forward to talking to you again this week. And Ian, hello. Um, and everybody else um, who's joining me, whether you're your first time or, or one of my regulars, um, welcome today. And, and again, um, this is a discussion today. And, you know, and I know I'm kind of moving fast, so it's, it's hard for you guys to text your type, you know, and, and be part of that conversation. Um, but this is a brainstorming session. This is a working design session. So please, everybody feel free to add ideas, throw out ideas, tell me I suck, whatever. You know, it's, um, it's okay. Like this is what today is about, right? To, to really try to see how would you work in a group, group setting to, to do this. And so, um, so let's kind of dive in. We've got a lot to cover today if we're going to try to wrap things up, you know, a little bit. And um, please, if, if any of you have a, a specific topic um, that you want me to cover, um, for example, maybe next week I might dive into combat a little bit more or something. So that's why I haven't decided if I'm going to move on or not, because I think there's still a couple of really relevant topics to talk about. Um, but I think today what we're going to attempt to try to do is I want to show you the correlations between gameplay systems in level design systems. And I want you to kind of see how level design and game system designs are, are these very closely related things. And, and as game designers, we're often like, you know, one job or the other. Like, you know, uh, unless you're a small indie developer, um, quite often, if you, especially if you're a big AAA developer or something, you're kind of categorized as a system designer or a level designer. And you may or may not have, you know, um, input in both worlds. 
And but you really need to and you really have to kind of understand, you know, if you are building systems and, and again, for those of you who don't understand what a system is, a system would be like, how do I run? How do I jump? How do I shoot? You know, that second to second gameplay and how does that work with like the player character? Right. And that's what a game system is. But levels themselves also have systems. And we kind of started to talk about some of that um, last week, but the but the, the levels themselves, the environments, whether it's an interior, an exterior, open world, linear, whatever that is, um, have systems that are related to gameplay that are unique to the levels themselves um, and that have really tight correlation to the gameplay systems and the game system mechanics. Um, and you need to understand those really well if you're a level designer because, for example, taking like jump, double jump, high jumps, you know, um, you know, a boost assist from a, from a jet pack or something like that, right? How you move through a level, um, is very dependent on your gameplay systems, right? And so if you are blindly just making a gameplay system and making, say, all the movement mechanics and you aren't taking into account the levels and how the levels are designed, then you may be like, Oh, this sounds really fun. And this sounds really cool. And like, I'm going to design a whole bunch of stuff here. And then the level guy looks at it and goes like, oh my God, like how the hell do I use that? Like that doesn't work and that's not fun. And that like completely breaks everything for me, right? And so so both sides need to work really closely together. Game design is all about communication. And you'll hear me say this over and over and over again, but I can't understate it about that you have to work as a team. You have to work together. And this isn't about like, even if I'm the creative director, even if I'm the project lead, even if I'm the guy who's the boss, you know, whatever you want to call that and whatever title you put on that, it's a team effort, right? Game design is a team effort. And so it, it can come across sometimes as hard because as, as a team leader, my job often is to keep us on track, keep us on time and on budget, you know, and to take a thousand ideas and then try to make those into this cohesive product that all works together because a lot of people are just kind of, I hate to say these cogs in a wheel, right? But a lot of people are designing their little piece of everything. They're designing, you know, one guy might be designing the movement system. Another guy might be designing the combat system. Another guy is designing a level, you know, and those three guys, if they're not working really closely together, get into trouble, right? And then what happens when they get into trouble? And then, you know, it's up to me to kind of be like, is the project leader or something to say, like, okay, guys, why aren't you talking? Why aren't you working together? And I understand these things might be conflicting with each other, but here's, here's a common solution. And so it comes across sometimes as, is maybe the, as a, as a creative director type or something that you're dictating. Um, and I think um, Luke talked, I think if I remember right, you asked a question about this even last week. Like, how do you manage all these problems, right, of communication that people are trying to to manage and they're, they're trying to, you know, work together and make decisions, you know, and stuff. And it's hard because you want to design with everybody's inputs. You want to design, you know, with, and taking everybody's input into account. But in the same hand, in the end, you know, I, I personally don't believe in design by committee. And some people like Valve, they have a, they call it a cabal process. Um, other studios kind of do the same thing where it's kind of like everybody's opinion is important. So we're going to take everybody's opinion and then we're going to try and go, you know, make a game out of it. And that works to a point, but there's a point where that just slows you down and bogs you down so much that you can't make decisions. And that's also the problem with a lot of really big teams. Um, there's been several big teams lately I've, I've talked to and um, these teams are over a thousand people. Right. And if you don't know, like, you know, some of the, some of the really big teams in this industry, um, some of the biggest titles out there are, are easily a thousand to twelve hundred people. I don't know if I've heard of any that are over twelve hundred, but, um, I'm sure they, they might even exist. And that's on a single product, not at a company, but just on a single game or single product. And on some of those teams, they have between 50 and 70 leads. So if you think about it, there's, you know, this, there's this incredible hydra there of, of nastiness of 50 people or 70 people that all have to come to consensus on something. And a lot of these teams don't have a, a great leader or have no leader structure. And everybody has to kind of get in a room and decide these things together. And that doesn't work, it, you know, and then they just spin and they spin and they spin. And it's really hard to get consensus and try to make everybody happy. And that's what, you know, a team leader has to do. And so it can be, um, um, it can be really challenging. So yes, that's Luke exactly the problem with you know three four three and Halo and a lot of projects that they, in my my opinion, kind of lack really strong leadership. And it's and it's tough. 
in this day and age, especially that we want to value everybody's opinions, right? We want to bring everybody's opinions in. We want to really take all those into account. But when we're making a worldwide product that's going to ship in 52 or 100 countries, you know, that's going to be, you know, played by 70 or 100 million people if we're lucky, you know, and, and so we have to be, you know, building a product that's going to sell really well all around the world. And, you know, we, and we're, we're usually part of some big publisher or investors or we have all these people that all have their differences of opinions of like how they want the game to be. And then we as the team members all have to try to work this all together. It can be nasty. So I don't want to get off on, on a rabbit hole here, but but I want you to see that how we put all these things together um, is really, really critical. And how, how we make these things come together into a cohesive game um, is really challenging. And and again, communication's everything. You you re- you have to realize that ninety nine percent of the time you're going to design on a team, right? You know, unless you're at a little small indie or you're doing something for yourself or whatever, you are working in a team. And that team, um, even if you're the only designer on a team, you're still on a team. You know, very few games, you know, occasionally get done by one person, right? Then you don't have to answer anybody but me, myself, and I. And even those three for me fight all the time. So you know, you know, I. I am my own worst enemy half the time. So, so, so it's not easy to understand that you have to work with your artists. You have to work with your engineers and everybody else on your team to, to also make sure that what you're building works for them, right? For a variety of reasons, whether that's technical or bringing in their artistic opinions or whatever these things are. And so today, what I want to kind of show you is this concept of like, how do we put all these things together, right? How are we putting all these disparate pieces together when we're designing. And, and so the analogy I use a lot is an onion, right? And so if you think about an onion, there's, there's thousands of layers, right? And there's all these layers of an onion that we, that we peel off as we're getting down towards the core. And the mistake that you can easily make in game design, and this is where it sometimes takes experience, but we're all cautioned if you're new in, in game design to, to try to learn is that, you know, there's times and places to, to kind of go deep and there's times and places to go wide. And usually, usually you want to kind of go wide and then you kind of dive in deeper and deeper into features over time. Because if you don't, what ends up happening is you'll dive in really too deep on like one particular system and you'll, you'll, you'll in your mind perfect it and you'll just get like, Oh my God, I got this amazing system. Let's just say combat even, right? And I'll just design like the ultimate combat system and just get everything working in combat you know, that, that could be possibly there. And in my mind, it's like the perfect combat system, the best that's ever been designed, you know, and then the movement guy comes along and goes like, but that's not how we move in the game. And like, what are you talking about? And like, that's not how traversal is going to work. And oh, by the way, did you know we have vehicles in the game, you know, and that completely breaks your whole combat system. And oh, by the way, we can fly. Did you know that we could fly? And so that breaks the combat system again. And do you know in the story, we don't have lasers and you put all these lasers in the story or you put all these lasers in your combat system, but the IP doesn't support lasers and we can't use lasers in the IP. You know, so you can see how it can very quickly like devolve where you, you go down deep and you make this really amazing thing and then you realize like, hey, it didn't work, right? Or, you know, the engineers are like, yeah, it's a great idea, but, you know, the game's only going to work at X number of frames per second with X number of polygons and blah, blah, blah. And oh, by the way, your idea of having 500 enemies on screen at one time we can't do that, right? So boom, 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 boom. You're hitting all these walls, right? And then suddenly those three months of work you just did to design this, what you thought in your mind was this perfect combat system didn't work because it didn't work with everything else, right? You had to talk to your team. You have to work with your team. You have to understand, you know, from all aspects. And so so what we're trying to do and kind of show you a little bit today in this limited time we have is, is how to kind of, as an onion, to, to work big strokes, to work, you know, kind of mile high and then come down to 100,000 foot and 10,000 foot, you know, and, and, and work down kind of deeper the best we can, um, you know, so that we understand that all these things kind of fit together and they, they, they initially might kind of bump against each other and then eventually kind of fit a little bit better and then over time like fit way better together, right? Um, but we need to just be aware that, that we have to get consensus, we need to work with our team. And so so just like you saw me working last week, if you're here watching, 
um, quite often I'll do very high level documents, you know, of a feature, very high level things to kind of go then pitch, you know, to my team and whether that's other designers, artists, engineers, executives, whoever needs to be involved in that decision, I can maybe have just say a one pager, something really simple, something really concise, um, that I can get the idea across to them and I can say like, Hey guys, do you have 30 minutes or an hour next week? I want to pitch to you, you know, the combat system for the game and the high level idea for what I have. But I've only spent maybe a couple days on it at this point, maybe a few hours. But, you know, but it's something there that just to say like, Hey, here's, here's my idea. It's still kind of big. Does this fit with what everybody else thinks might be possible? It doesn't mean that it's going to be exactly that or exactly perfect or whatever when you get it finished. But this is like, okay, here's my roadmap, right? Here's the direction I'm going to go. You know, like, yes, 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 yes. Okay, good. Let's go, right? Get the blessings and then move forward. But if you spend weeks and months working in isolation and working, you know, without your team, um, not getting the input from your the rest of your team as well, um, then you just don't know, right? And, and so that's where it gets really tricky. And so I really want you guys to kind of see how all these things are kind of fitting together. Um, and then specifically today with level design and system design, um, because both of those are these two different areas that are very, you know, that work very much together, but they're, they're kind of opposing each other in some regards. And so, um, for any of you that are in my course, um, Luke and others, you'll see that, um, you know, I teach level design and system design together for a reason. And not only does it double the amount of jobs or more that you can potentially take on, um, and maybe get, you know, have a higher chance of getting a job, but I'm doing that because you need to see both sides. You need to see when I design a system, how does it work in a level? And then when I'm in a level, like how's that system work for me? And then by the way, when I'm in working in levels, like what systems are unique to levels? So, so that you need to design levels and levels are much more than just, a, a you know, sitting down with your, with your crayons and drawing out a map. Like when you, when you go out and design a level, it's not just, design the picture, right? It really is form and function again. And a lot of the function of a level is really like, what are you going to do in it? You know, what do you, you know, so objectives and quests and, you know, all these kinds of things. And there's all these other systems that are kind of, again, related to gameplay systems, but are really unique to the levels themselves. And, and some systems might be specifically unique to a certain level or a certain area of the game or something like that. So you might have specific stuff that's only seen on that level or in that area of a game as well, um, you know, that can also be unique. And, the, and those are the kinds of things you need to sort of understand. And so we're going to kind of try to show you how we're going to go back and forth a bunch today. And hopefully that doesn't confuse you too much, but we're going to kind of show you how like we'll do a little bit here and then jump up here and do a little bit here and then jump down here and keep kind of going back and forth you know, as we keep designing and keep thinking about stuff. And then occasionally we might have an idea. And so we go down a little bit of a rabbit hole, you know, and we may design a little system a little bit deeper um, than we need to. But sometimes we do that because we it's in our head and we got to get it out. But but if you really want to be a great designer, the idea is how do you limit yourself, you know, again, to, to not deep dive too, too deep into something, um, even though the idea may be there, just be cautioning yourself when you spend more than a day or more than a week on something, you got to kind of ask yourself, like, is that where I should be spending my time right now? Um, and as one last caveat before we jump in, um, keep in mind that um, this is what I'm showing you is kind of a perfect world. And and so we often and mo more often than not, we don't work in a perfect world. And so quite often what we have to design and when we have to design it is often dictated by my team members and what they're waiting to work on, because one of my clients is not just the players, but the client is also my team members who need to implement my my vision. And so sometimes I I'm forced to deep dive into certain areas, um, you know, just because there's like literally programmers or artists or somebody waiting to implement that whole system, and I don't really have the luxury of time to to go think in theory land for weeks or months, design something and then say like, okay guys, here you go. It's more like, you know, the executives go, you got a day, like get them working. And, you know, so they stop, you know, sitting around and that's quite often um, the bane of my existence sometimes where people are waiting and I'm getting yelled at because people are sitting around. And so I'm making kind of rush or bad decisions um, or not working optimally because I need to get them going keep them going and so just be aware that quite often we also need to to 
you know, serve them team members. And sometimes a lot of these ideas, we also need to touch it and feel it and try it. And so documentation and what I'm showing you now is, is one side of the coin, but implementation and, and building it out and understanding it that way is also really critical. The question is, you know, for each team and each project and each company, that process can be really different. And so you just need to understand like, when do I stop designing on paper? When do I start implementing? You know, and that's a hard question to ask because I think every, everyone's a little different. Every, everything has a little bit of a different need. So let's um, answer a couple questions for Luke really quick. Um, let's see, how much would you be thinking about doability, how doable certain systems are? Are considerations about how technical designers, artists, and writers can adapt to your ideas at the forefront of the process, or are these considerations brought in later in the ideation process? So, Luke, it's it's an impossible question. I mean, there, there's a point where in the really early days, so you know, if I'm going to be working on a project for and designing it for months, you know, like in that first week or two, I may just be like anything goes, right? There, and, you know, and really throughout the whole project, I mean, there's no such thing as a bad idea. But I might quickly eliminate ideas or push them to the back burner or put them kind of in the, the TBD section, brainstorming section, whatever you want to call it, um, because of the feasibility of them just isn't great. And so for me personally, um, because of my my vast experience and because I also spent you know almost half my career, well, over 30, 40% of my career as a producer, um, I do get scheduling and, and production and that kind of stuff um, better than a lot of people. And so it's it's hard as a game designer because you don't always know, again, where you're going to hit a wall on, you know, is this a good or a bad idea? Can we even implement it technically with the time, the budget, the resources, you know, and all these other things that we have. And so that's, again, why the importance of, of creating really, really, really high-level specifications, really just high-level, like, what are we going to build? And then getting the buy-off from your team um, sooner than later so that your team kind of gets some sense for, like, oh, wait, you're totally crazy. Like, there's absolutely no way we can do that. Then you can kind of move on, um, you know, or, you know, having the team go, like, well, maybe. Like, I guess we could prototype it or we could try it. Or let's explore it, but we're not sure, right? And that's okay. And it's okay to be in that, like, I'm not sure category. You just have to kind of quickly weed out the, like, your absolutely crazy ideas um, and, and try to get into a more productive, you know, okay, here's here's the stuff that we is risky, but we think we can do it. Here's the stuff that's just super easy, like, done that a million times, like, no risks, no whatever um, kind of things. And so that middle area is probably your pillars, and it's probably the, the core things usually that are kind of in the game that we talked about a couple weeks ago with building your pillars out. And generally those are the new things and slightly risky things that you want to do. And you want to have a couple of those to, to try to innovate and try to differentiate yourself from everybody else. And so, but, you know, again, you, you just need to be really, really careful about like, well, what is that going to mean to the game? And what's it going to, you know, what's, you know, is that going to break something or or whatever, right? And um, and you can look at games, I'll use an example like No Man's Sky. Um, for those of you that played No Man's Sky, especially like in the beginning, it was like a great idea, like to have all these like randomly generated worlds and randomly generated everything and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so the technology behind that, which was really what was driving a lot of the design choices and design decisions um, was spectacular. And, you know, they, they had incredible, you know, tech there. But from a design perspective, that tech drove so much of that that ultimately, in my opinion, and I, and I would say that most of the press and stuff kind of agreed, like the fun just wasn't there because it was like so kind of like a tech demo of like, yeah, look at this great tech and we can do this really great thing with it. But then, you know, it just wasn't fun either. And so so both angles can be can be dangerous. You can you can drive decisions based on tech based on the ip based on the art the story the game design you know all these things and one of those can can over dominate the others and then ultimately like really like lead your product down a bad way and so that's where again back to the onion you know think about all these big layers that you're trying to layer in together and you're trying to make them all work together and that's where you know when you have these higher level you know these higher level ideas and you kind of get get all these higher levels there and even if they again don't you're not designing them in in detail so like let me show you guys 
really quick here, like what I was talking about, you know, when we were designing last week, you know, and I was rapidly putting together, I mean, this was a um, 26 page document. I would say I wrote 20 pages of this just last week and, you know, in, in two hours or less, you know, so you can see that when you, when you know what you're working on and you're using systemic stuff, you can move pretty quickly. Um, and I'm pointing that out to, to those of you that you know, are in my programs and stuff, because I know that, I, that a lot of my students um, have suffered from this, where this same document would have taken them years to write, you know, and, and it's just, it's just hard when you really sit down and put it on paper to like wrap your head around it and just to detail these things out. And, and I know that a lot of people struggle with this. Um, and so I want to point out that, that this process can be very quick. Um, but a lot of this process, I'll call it brainstorming right now, is really about ideation and like, can we, should we, could we, right? And so you'll see that um, however you want to list these things out, like, so sometimes I'll put in like TBD. Um, sometimes I will change a color to say orange. And so what what that means to me is, so for example, um, um, I'll just do this really quick. So what I'm trying to show here is that like, um, now what I'm going to do here, and I'm just doing this to, to illustrate a point right now is like moving this to red. So I use color a lot. And, and so on something like this, I could put TBD and I could put, you know, something in orange, which basically is kind of like, if you think about a stoplight, like green, orange, red, right? And so orange to me is like, er, caution, like, mm, Maybe not, you know, so that's the kind of stuff that I'm still thinking about, right? That's the kind of stuff that I'm like, mm, maybe not. And then stuff that's in red is like, er, hard stop. Like now I don't like to get rid of ideas and, and red will often get moved into another bucket down in the very bottom in a brainstorming thing. So I don't lose it. But, but usually red is typically like, at least for now. And again, I could change my mind tomorrow, but at least for now in my mind, like, okay, we can swim on the water. We can dive down a little bit under the water, but when we dive down, we hold our breath. But you know, and then we can come back up, you know, before we start taking damage. Um, but I'm not going to put on an air tank or have some technology or something that allows me to to dive using you know mechanical assisted you know thing or or whatever that is, magic or whatever um, to dive underwater for an extended period of time. Um, and again, I'm not saying that for this particular game is there, but I'm trying to show you guys how, as we're brainstorming through these things, um, why this process and this back and forth can be good because what this one thing did was it made me think about swimming. And I didn't have to detail it out. Like I, it's, you know, three lines really of, or four lines of text, right? I didn't go into like the super deep, like, oh, I got to hold my breath for X amount of time. And, you know, when I do, a, you know, a bar pops up and, you know, and then, you know, I have 30 seconds to dive before, you know, I have to surface or I start taking damage and blah, 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 right? I could, I can, um, I could detail out swimming in like uber detail, right? I could put in pages or at least paragraphs of information here. But for right now, by kind of putting this in here, by putting in the the like the swim and then kind of there, I can kind of ask myself like, does this fit or not? Like, do I like this or not? Right. But but by knowing that it's that it's there, um, I kind of know like, you know, I need to I need to ask myself and maybe the team members. Like, is this something that that we need to address? Talk about? Do other people like the idea or not like the idea? You know, does it fit in with you know? Maybe the art team had something really cool they were planning, or the engineering team, or another designer might have been like, dude, like I had the like the most awesome underwater level design, you know, idea that you've ever imagined in your life. And like I need to have diving, right? And so you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm a system designer over here, and I didn't really think diving was important. And I go talk to my level designer, and he's like, I gotta have it, right? And so that's where teamwork, communication, you know, and that kind of stuff um really is is helpful. 
you know, because again, you, you just can't design in a vacuum, you know, and you're very, very, very rarely, if ever, going to design as a person, right, as an individual. And so you need to have that communication and talking about it. And you got to be open to ideas, you know, because again, you know, whether it's an idea right now or whether it's an idea you have later, um, you need to kind of know that the that these, you know, systems, you know, again, could, you know, could come back later, even in your ideation process and, and suddenly be like the best idea you've ever had and be a game changer. And you just don't know, right? And so so just be aware of that's why sometimes you'll see the coloring or, or TBDs, things like that, because this is really a process that I go through in kind of my brainstorming for these things. All right. So if you guys remember from last week, you know, again, we, we, we wrote out this, this document, again, using headings here so that we can create a nice little quick, you know, jump around here. Remember that I'm also using a lot of, um, so you can see here again, red, you know, stuff that I'm cutting, but I'm, but I'm leaving it there just in case I might want to bring it back. Right. But, and, you know, for now it's not something I'm going to detail. Um, but Again, like, you know, putting in lots of links, putting in lots of, you know, embedding in pictures, embed in videos, you know, make these living documents, right, that really help express ideas. But finding the ways in the process to work right, again, you know, will really help you. So, jumping down, you know, in the core gameplay, you know, we, we know that movement is, is usually really important in levels. And, um, and so you need to kind of first understand, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about level design, level creation, and system design, the first area that you want to think about are, are these kinds of games, you know, these kinds of components, right? And so it, we already previously defined this as an action RPG. Now, that's a very broad category, right? And, and so now there's a point where there's also games um, that we consider a platforming game. Right. And, and both these genres can kind of overlap a little bit and, and if not a lot. Um, but you as a game designer, again, there's not there's not a right or wrongs here. Um, but I'll put here just. Um, so I'm going to be putting this in here in the way that I would define platforming mechanics Um in comparison to other things is that the platforming mechanics would be kind of taking jumping and other kinds of stuff farther. Right. And so, so again, these are not necessarily bad things, but we need to decide where does a player, where is a player going to spend his time? Where is the player going to, going to do these things? You know, is he just kind of running and doing basic jumps? Um, you know, and, um, so this could be, you know, um, You know, I'm, you know, I'm not even needing to define this like fully right now, right? But there's jumping up, there's jumping out, you know, the, the typical double jump, you know, maybe it's that simple. Um, but, you know, these platform mechanics and where these kind of, again, start to, where we need to start to understand these things is like, for example, um, moving platforms, which I can't spell. Um, so... You know that would be an example of where the world and the levels um, really need to to understand. You know, you need to understand like how far are you going to take it, right? Do you have platforms that are moving and doing other things and stuff? Because that kind of gets into what we genre-wise think of as a platforming game. And again, that's not a that's not wrong to have in the genre. It's not wrong to have in this game, but it changes the player, the type of player that are interested in that. You know, and the type of player that want to do that. It, it's it's a little hit and miss. You have to be careful about like, you know, ask yourself, does an RPG player, if I'm getting an action RPG, you know, and that kind of thing, do I want to have a, a game that has, you know, more Twitch, you know, when it comes to the platforming elements and the exploration elements um, or, or not. Right. And, and again, you know, it's not, um, it's not always a, a really clear line that has to be, um, where you have to, you know, um, go back and forth there. 
but you need to be careful about that, that some players are just not going to like those types of mechanics and therefore and it may not work in your world or in your universe you know and especially like with superheroes that can do a lot of flying and things you know they may just fly right over it but the other caveat of why this is um, something that I probably wouldn't put in is because right now we're talking about we want teams and one of our core pillars are teams and um, and that would right now in my mind is going to be four characters and um, maybe someday in co-op it's you know it's one human player and three AI to start with but it could be four human players in co-op or or something like that but but regardless um, let's just assume for now it's it's one human player and and three AI. Um, Things like platforming and stuff, when I'm not in control of a single unit, um, start to start to become a little bit harder because when you start getting like timing puzzles and stuff, like me as a player, I could go run and jump and hit a platform and then it carries me over and then I jump off of it. Um, but then what do my other three guys do, right? Are they good enough? Like if they're a little bit laggy behind and I run ahead and then I jump on a moving platform and it moves over here and these guys are like, like now I'm stuck. You know, and do I go like, are they on my camera? And then like I get on a moving platform and now my camera goes off of them and now they're off camera and they get attacked. Like there's all these edge cases, right? Of like where these things need to understand, you know, need to work together. But you can see how like one part of that's game system design, one part of that's like level design, right? And like, and so you need to be kind of understanding both sides, you know, to kind of understand like, is this fun? Is this cool? Is this something that I want to do, right? And or not? And so, so that's where you have to be careful here, right? That's where you have to be thinking about this in the levels um, and be thinking about this there. But but the the movement systems within a level um, can be you know some of the most important things for you to understand initially because in game systems that's going to have some of the most important impact on it, and so. Um, so you might even, you know, put a note here and just to say like, you know, so I'm just putting a quick note in there, you know, both for myself, um, you know, and for others or whatever, just to, um, oops. So, you know, that complicates advanced movement systems. Um, and so, but I want you guys to kind of see like that's, you know, again, I've seen systems where, you know, like I can jump and then my AI just kind of knows how to kind of jump behind me. But again, it just gets tricky, you know, and then you also have to be thinking about like, say, movement systems. So what happens if we have a set of four characters um, and they all don't have the same movement mechanics? Um, and so what happens now in my levels? Right. And so that's that's this like crazy sets of edge cases where you're like, OK, I've got, you know, um, Batman, Superman, you know, the Hulk and Thor or whatever, right? And, and you've got like a bunch of characters and some can fly, some can jump really high, some have devices, you know, um, some are big, some are small, you know, like all these kinds of things, right? And like, how do they all move through the world together, you know, and, and, and especially in a game, you know, and, and stuff. And again, you know, if, if they're supposed to go up to a higher level, like, and, you know, one character can't get up there, you know, what happens? Does Superman, like, grab, you know, two guys and, whoosh, and fly up with them and, you know, and drop them off somewhere, you know, and take them with them? But, you know, like, how is that going to how is that going to work, right? It, there's just lots and lots and lots of edge cases that you have to be aware of um, when you have this four-player, four characters. And so, so movement systems kind of tend to devolve into stuff that's a little bit simpler, um, if you had made the choice that you could, you, that you were just going to be one superhero at a time, um, then that's okay, you know. And, and you you could do a, a much more like Assassin's Creed level kind of thing, right? And so so any of these systems, um, 
you know, need to be, you need to look at them from edge cases. And this is where the job of a game designer, we, we joke about it, but it's really kind of true that quite often, you know, we do, you know, what we think is 80% or 90% of the, the, the work of the design. And we have this thing almost fully designed in our mind, but then, you know, in honest reality, we've only done maybe 20% of the work, you know, we've got 80% more left just to solve all the stupid edge cases that keep popping up. Um, like flying, you know, again, if I have Superman, you know, and I have another, you know, I don't know, Ant-Man or I don't know, some other character that's there, but we're talking about a game where potentially, let's just say we're planning to have a hundred superheroes, right? The, the, the amount of, of differences in their skills and abilities and all that stuff could be massive, right? So how do you create in right now in gameplay systems, a series of things that are really cohesive that like fit all those guys and so, you know, um, so that's, again, tricky. So, like, for example, um, so, you know, again, I will, for myself, I often put in asterisks um, as, as a way for me, and then I'll generally um, italicize um, these things. So, you know, sometimes I'll put them in a color or something as well, but these are, or I may put the word note or whatever, but I will very often, um, you could also insert comments as well as another way. So, so sometimes I'll insert comments as well. Um, and I like inserting comments sometimes if it's something I need to come back and address. The reason I'll do an insert comment is because, and I won't do it right now because it makes the screen go way off and I'm trying to not, I'm trying to keep this visible, you know, and easy for you guys to read, but I'll, but I'll insert a comment because then I see it off on the right hand side. And then, you know, I'll, I'll tell myself like, Hey dummy, come back and re come back and figure this out, you know? And so when my document gets a little bit big, it's kind of more like almost a task for me sometimes like, come back and think about this some more and I'll move on from something because I'm going down other things, but I'll remind myself to come back and try to solve this particular problem. And so this is a perfect case of an edge. This is a perfect example of an edge case of how do we solve um, flying in a level, you know, if only one or, or more um, characters can do that. And so, so then, you know, another example of this is, um, So this is um, so this is a huge, huge thing. And in fact, you know, right now I might even highlight this. Ah, sorry if you guys can't read that. That's not the good color on inverse colors here. Let's see. Um, let's put like a um, okay. That's a little bit better. Um, and, and in this particular case, I'm highlighting it to show, like, I got to solve this problem, actually. I, and I need to understand this problem because um, this could definitely be something that bites you in the butt really quickly and either makes or breaks your game. And so if you don't have examples of this being done in games, um, you need to really, like, be aware of, like, how, how bad it can be if you start splitting your team up. So a good example of this would be um, like even, you know, in my in one of the games, much as Odyssey that I worked on, that was only two characters and we could split up the characters and they each had different movement. And so there were certain parts of the level that both of them could um, could move on. And then, for example, water, only Munch, who is this, you know, fish like creature could swim. Abe um, couldn't swim, right? And so so then there was times where like Munch could swim over here and then get over to this location and hit a switch to open a door that would then let Abe in to come around that corner. So we had puzzles, for lack of a better definition, within the world, within the level, within the environment that allowed you know this kind of tag team back and forth and there would be times where I'd split up and go over here but then I'm like oh this can be risky because like you know Munch didn't have any attack you know and he was completely defenseless so if I took him into certain areas without Abe you know then you know that was a problem but 
but you could see how we're getting your guys split like really far away. Suddenly in a level like could be really problematic, you know, and it's really hard to control that. Like how do you win the level or how do you keep people from getting stuck? And that was just with two characters. You get four, you got four times as many edge cases and problems. And, and that was in a game that had two characters with, with very fixed capabilities, you know, and we're not talking about a four person four character game where they can have a whole crazy amount of different abilities, right? Um, from, so, you know, look at the flash and super fast movement to, you know, Aquaman who can swim underwater and Superman who can fly and like all these things, right? And there's just, there's so many differences that you might be able to have in here that the more separated out your characters get across a level, it just can get really messy. And so, um, and then you get into like cameras and controls and interface issues and all the other stuff of like, how do I even know where and how to find those other guys and, and, and get them back together again, you know, and, and stuff. And so that can be, um, very problematic. And so that's something that, that you need to be sort of, sort of aware of when you're, when you're designing these types of games and these kinds of systems. And so this is not a trivial question. Um, and this might be one of the harder questions actually in the game to, to sort of answer at some levels. And so when the game is more tactical or, or whatever, again, you just have to kind of understand how far do you allow these things to separate. Another one of my games that had this problem was Rainbow Six. And so if you guys have played Rainbow Six Vegas, um, it's three it's three characters and I can separate those so the, the player can control one of the one of the characters with AI controlling the other two, um, all three characters have different skills and abilities, and then you could do tactical things where you know, for example, if we had a room um, and there was two doors in, like I could I could go to this door here, for example, and use my snake camera that looked under a door, and I could go in and I could tag um, or mark basically a you know and give an objective to one of my teammates, and I could basically say like okay, on the go, like, take this guy out. And then I could run over to another door, and then basically I could trigger an entry where I would bust in the door, and then they would bust in the door, and I would know that they were going to shoot this guy while I shot this guy, you know, and you could do these kinds of things. Um, but it requires a certain level of intelligence, and, and the player needs to be able to give a certain level of command because when you rely on just AI... Um, and the AI to, to solve these problems, um, like how aggressive and to, to how defensive the characters are, like in a battle. So this is going to be something we'll get into again later, but this is, it's relevant here to movement, um, especially, and, and even the, the walk run, you know, kind of thing where if you don't know, so me as a player, for example, I might be wanting to play very defensively. I might be really low on health. You know, I might be like going into a battle that I know is going to be really hard. And so like I'm keeping my guys together and I'm trying to like move them forward so that when we get to the boss or we get to this thing, like we can boom, pound on them together. And that's the way I want to play. But, you know, the AI might be like, nah, you know, I want to kind of play this way. And the AI is suddenly, you know, we get in a little close and then one guy is just like, woohoo! I'm going to go, I'm off, see you guys. And he, you know, he starts moving on his own because he's decided he's going to attack with, say, a melee weapon, you know, versus my other guys had, like, longer range attacks planned. And suddenly some idiot runs in there and dies. And now I'm like, oh, now I'm like down one guy. I've, that basically is 25% of my total capacity for attacking. And I was hoping this other guy was going to do something else for me. And now I'm screwed and I, and I, and I can't, you know, do that really well, right? So, so even how I move in my AI and how the AI controls the teams and things like that gets really tricky in a real-time game. Remember, we're doing a real-time game and not a turn-based game like XCOM or something like that. So in a turn-based game, it slows things down enough that I can be like, okay, well, strategically, like you move here and you move here, you know, and I can kind of take that time to, to, to position people just right. We're not doing that. Right. And so that ramps up our, our level of difficulty a couple notches um, and the edge cases kind of go through the roof. And so I know that, you know, like with Rainbow Six, there was a lot of things that we experimented with. Um, and for example, even in the interface, um, we actually put like the character icons. So what we actually did was we were, we were rendering a, a side view of the characters 
and 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 then and just in a, in a blank wireframe. So what we'd actually see on our UI was like the characters doing exactly what they were doing. So I'd see if they were shooting, I'd see if they were running, or if they were on the ground dead, or whatever. And then they they had basically an outline around the character. This was the original design, not the one that came out for the final game. Um, but but what we were trying to do was then the 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 health bar was inside that character silhouette. You know, and it would go down. It would also like flash red if they were under attack, and um, and it would also glow if they like saw an enemy and things like that. Because again, when I start to spread things out, when when everything's off my camera, I lose awareness, right? And so you now need to rely on like audio and UI um, or some kind of clues so that you understand like what's going on, right? Because the area you are in with your particular character might be safe, and you'd be like, hey, this is kind of nice, and I'm having fun, and Let's all grab, you know, grab a drink and let's have some lunch, you know, while your other three teammates are like, ah, we're dying. Everything's going crazy. And there's 10,000 troops around us. And you're like, what are you talking about? Like, it's okay over here. Right. And, you know, and if you don't have feedback, if the player doesn't know what's going on there, then it can be trouble. Right. And so that's where, again, these systems are, are tricky and we need to understand that. Now to jump over to level design for a minute, I want to talk about how um, I want to keep kind of showing how this this sort of works is in world gameplay. Um, here, let's talk about movement. You know, um, and this is um, so. So I'm again kind of putting putting little notes in there, but. How do teams move? You know, um, so for example, bah, bah. Um, so as we start to think about now, just movement, like how how am I moving through this world, right? And then, but you have to kind of ask yourself, what is the world, right? Do I understand the level? Do I understand how big, you know, the space is going to be, right? So if I have four characters, uh, that means that more than likely I'm going to have a minimum of four enemies and probably more like eight to 12 to 16 and maybe more. We talked about massive battles. I'm not even going to talk about that in this context. That's another problem. Um, but you need to suddenly realize that like you might have, 20 plus enemies in a battle scenario, right? So in this in this particular location, let's just say this is going to be where we know there's a big battle that's going to go on. Because I have four characters who are very powerful, I need to have an X number of enemies that are going to be able to be a challenge to those four characters, right? And so all that stuff requires a certain amount of space, um, you know, and, and size. And so how we design our levels and the types of levels we do you know, could get really tricky really fast if we're not understanding like how big these things are. Another another similar thing um, is um, the you know is other vehicles um, and you know and I'm and I'm putting that you know there. Um, You know, and these are all factors to, that we have to really think about because they all, um, um, you know, these all really, really, really affect how the team itself moves and the, you know, and how big the space is and stuff. So, for example, um, vehicles are tricky for, for several reasons. Um, now vehicles can be nice because maybe I put four people in the equivalent of like an APC, right? So like a armored vehicle or a car that, you know, my four guys, they all jump in and then now it's easy because I got one vehicle that I can run around. Um, well, how does that affect your level design, right? Well, first of all, vehicles are bigger. And so the, the, the total amount of space needed, you know, for a vehicle might be two or three meters or four meters, in, in width um, versus one meter, say for a human, you know, and so you have to understand like, you know, well, do I have a bunch of trees? Do I have a bunch of obstacles? Like how is my level kind of being built? And then if that's, if that's the case, 
then you know a, a car is not going to drive through there, right? There's too many things, and so that's that's part of the the brilliance in the design is you may want to put things there so that the players cannot use their vehicles everywhere. So if there's vehicles in the game, you know you can use objects and the size differenti differentiators between those things to to help differentiate, you know where. I can use vehicles and where I can't, right? So that's one factor with vehicles um, that you have to understand again is like, again, how big is just kind of everything? What are these types of spaces that I need to design, you know, and how big are they, right? Because this ultimately affects the theme of the game, the, the look, the concept. So this is almost coming back to the brand and the IP at some levels about like, you know, so this starts to get like, you know, um, you know, um, also just, yeah, are there interiors, right? And so all these are kind of like questions where you're like, yeah, those, those are challenges when you have four characters with, you know, 16 to 20 enemies or whatever it is, you know, vehicles flying, you know, what happens if I'm inside and, you know, and Superman decides he wants to fly, you're like, can, can he not fly? Like, do they does does flying get disabled when I'm inside? But what happens if I have you know a giant cavern, you know, and a big room that's inside that I could fly in? Like, is that allowed? You know, and then how does the camera and the controls work? You know, with four players, you know, in that right. So you can see these edge cases again. They build upon each other in bad ways, and that's where. As soon as we, we think that like, oh, this is really simple. Like, I just got four characters and some can fly and some can't. And like, boom, we're done, right? No, like it's not that easy. And, and so so the, 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 the life of a game designer is really about solving edge cases. That's, that's the hell we live in. Um, and, and sometimes that's fun and sometimes it just drives us crazy. And so you have to be aware of that and that, that that's the, the sort of the unglamorous side. I, I like the challenge. I like the puzzle of trying to figure out um, how to make these things work, right? Um, you know, but you want to make sure that that the um, that you're thinking through these things, right? Because it gets gets very complicated very fast, you know, and then suddenly you, you, you'll solve like one edge case. You think, oh, okay. I fixed it for flying, so flying works. And then suddenly somebody's like, but what about vehicles? And you're like, oh, okay, like that one didn't work, right? Okay, now i got to redesign flying to fix the flying vehicles, you know, in the rest of the level. Now, so so vehicles are, are big and wide, so that becomes one problem for them about where they can go. Um, and we're not even talking about airplanes and flying vehicles that, that combines, you know, so, so now vehicles become problematic because... Vehicles, you know, here I'll put, um, so, so vehicles can have a lot of different things in them, you know, that, that can really dramatically change the stuff. And so these, these next ones, and actually I'll put here, here above it, um, Now, and the reason I'm doing that is to show you here that, like, with vehicles, also have to deal with like flying. So, so, um, um, now the reason I'm putting that, um, so, distinguish that just for a second here before we forget so so flying as you know is a really 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 complicated thing in, in level design um because you know in open world games that's actually probably one of the most complicated things that you can get into because as soon as i can fly like if i have a big map and i you know and i can fly and the end of the map and the objective is like to say go kill this guy that's way over here so i'm i'm going from here to here and i can fly well i just get up i fly and fly over here kill this guy boom level done right like how do you stop that? You know, and so suddenly you now need systems upon systems to mitigate things like flying. Um, and then we're talking just in gameplay right now, right? Like, just like, how do you stop flying from being this thing that just allows you to do whatever you want to do? And literally, if, if the end of the game is to do X, Y, or Z, why can't I just fly right there and do it immediately? And now, you know, 
Um, so in games like Mercenaries um, that I worked on, you know, we had helicopters there and that became a, a problem where, so now we have to put in like say surface air missiles. And so, you know, I could get in my helicopter and I could start flying, but if I got into this area, it's like, mm, you know, like probably not the safest thing to do because these surface air missiles initially are actually, the, the initial missiles were designed to be not all that accurate. So I had a little bit of a buffer. I would give the player just a little bit of a warning where the lock-on system would tell them like, you know, like this typical warning that a real helicopter or airplane would have of like, hey, you've, you've got a lock on, like, and then you're like, right, turn around, I'm out of here, and you, you know you're in trouble. The first missiles might miss, but by the second missile, you're dead, right? And so it gave them just a little bit of warning, like, don't go there, um, but it's kind of this ways of stopping the player. And so that's that one problem alone, and I'm not even going to get into the technology issues and like, how hard it is to have, you know, as you get higher and higher, um, how much trouble it is to, to draw all of that, right? And it's a very different rendering engine. But the next related problem that is, that's for all three of these is movement and movement speed. And so, so whether you are a, a character on foot, um, you know, so take again, like the extreme example of the Flash, the fastest man on, on earth, or anything you know, thereof from like a normal, like how fast I can run to how fast a superhero can, can move. And whether that's a super speed run or a dash or whatever that is, right. A, a quick teleport, um, you know, those kind of things, right. There, there's a lot of stuff, um, you know, and we'll do like, let's just even say here, like, So just making notes kind of there of saying like there's lots of ways that, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways that this fast movement affects our levels. And so, so you know, we have to at some point, again, be building the system, but understanding the ramifications and the levels and how the levels themselves are built. Um, and so, again, speed, whether that comes through my individual characters or whether that comes through, you know, my... Um, um, my, you know, through a vehicle or whatever is allowing me to move faster um, is a big problem. So one of the problems like with vehicles in general, like even just taking a, let's just say a Jeep, let's say we're doing modern day and we even just put our four guys, we have, and let's just say we have four humans and this could be, you know, like in the game Mercenaries or if you're playing, you know, Ghost Recon these days or whatever it is, right? As soon as I get in a vehicle now, you know, I, I might move from say, you know, um, a movement speed of 10 and if I'm in a, in a run to suddenly now I'm at a movement speed of 40 you know four times faster if I'm in a vehicle that's like a jeep but then you know a helicopter might move you know if it was at full blast moving forward might move at 8 or 10 right and a jet might move at 20 you know whatever units per second right and I'm just using those in in, in relations to you know to each other right and so if that's the case, then what happens in vehicles where they get problematic is if I if I built out a, a level, and let's just say it's even just a big open arena there that's X number of meters across, and in my vehicle or my flash speed can suddenly just like you know, and I'm bouncing all around like like crazy there, then how you know like how does that how's that work in combat? How's that going to work there? How do I stop players? How do I stop their progression? You know, um, cause like even in the flash, like there could be an enemy with like with a gun, you know, point at him, but he moves so fast that they don't even have time to like pull the trigger and like shoot before he's already standing behind him and going knock, 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 poof, you know, and out you go. Right. And so that's the kind of thing where, you know, um, even him dodging bullets or other kinds of speed, you know, that's an extreme example, but that, you know, like, how do you stop that, right? How do you stop that in your level designs? How how do enemies, how can enemies fight that, right? Suddenly these 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 characters you have might almost become invincible. And that's where you have to be really careful. And so the faster that we move, the faster that we keep moving, you know, there, the, the harder that can be for us, you know, because then we still don't know, um, like, how to design a level because if I'm on foot and I might, and now let's just say that I don't have the super speed, right? Or maybe I don't have the vehicle. Now, I, and this is the problem with open world games a lot is that when I'm 
moving through the world now and I'm running, I'm like, okay, I'm really slow. And I mean, how many of you guys have played games like that where you're just bored silly because you're like, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, and I got to go back to town to do something, you know, and literally like an hour later, you know, you're, or 30 minutes later, you're finally like, get back to town, you drop off something, you do something, you got to run back again, you know, and you may or may not have a vehicle or or gasoline or whatever it is to, to control that vehicle. And so it gets problematic, right? So I just want you to see how, how that affects and how all these things from, the, the height and be able to go over types of terrain, over the kinds of terrain, um, to, you know, how fast they move, to how big the areas need to be, um, are all ways of, are all problems with, with when we're designing a player movement system that we have to be thinking about how is our level supposed to look? And where this can get even trickier is now let's say that we're making a real, a, a more real world level. And I, and I say that in the sense that, like, let's just say we want to make a city. This is like kind of the, the hardest example. Like, you know, and let's just say we want to we want to put this game. Think about like GTA or a game like that, you know, that's in a modern day-ish city. It, it doesn't have to be exactly New York or LA or whatever. But, but the city at some level follows roughly the guidelines for what a real city would be. City streets are so wide, you know, buildings are so tall. You know, there might be occasionally a river with a bridge over it, um, you know, and, and things like that and, and stuff. But then, like, how do you control the player and how do you control movement? And so, so that becomes the, you know, So, you know, these are these are kind of, um, I guess that's kind of a subset of this one. But um, so, you know, this can be um, things like, you know, um, you know, being able to go into like a, a real world level and trying to block the player. And let's let's assume right now, even that we were doing a game where we just said, you know what? This whole flying thing, because we're creating the new universe, right? We're creating the new superhero thing. So let's just do a design exercise for a second that even just says, like, hey, you know, um, let's just take flying out of this thing. That's just it just complicates things, and we'll just we'll 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 take out like super fast run, you know, super fast running, all these extreme things, right? So that the they're they're going to be four characters on foot that might have basic jump. You know, but but not anything too extreme. You know, maybe twice what a normal human can do, but not you know not crazy Superman type stuff, right? This is this is up for us to to figure out or for us to decide. You know, what what do we want here, right? And um, so the um, the problem, you know, and that that can that can help. But let's just say we're going down a city street now. Right, and and a lot of games have this problem, especially when they're not open world games. Um, is what happens? I'm going down the street, and I don't want you to go down like the side street, right? And but if it's just modern everyday, um, and there's not like a war going on or some other excuse, then like what happens if I just want to hang a left and, and go down Fifth Street, you know, and and go explore? Um, how do I stop you? Like, is there a big invisible wall there? You know, and like, what what keeps me on this path that I'm trying to, to build you on? Like, how far do we let you get off the paths before you can like devolve? And so there's now like a whole nother set of, of limiters there. And so, you know, um, and I'll actually put that in here. You know, and so you'll, you'll often hear me talk about limiters. And limiters apply to all aspects of game design. You know, and that we need to be able to limit the player on what he can do, where he can go, how he can do it. Because if not, he's almost invincible and it's not really fun. And, and, and players playing within the boundaries of the limits is really key and really important to the, the, the success of your game. And so, um, but movement limiters are a big part of that. And so I want you to kind of see that, that, that that's really, you know, really critical there. Um, and, um, so, you know, that's something you need to, to take into account again of how, how are you going to limit, you know, the, the movement there. 
And so, um, let's see here. Now, um, let's see. But, you know, again, you know, um, let's, let's also put in here, um, Um, so again, you know, the, the natural train, this is, this is one of the advantages when you're building a, a real world, let's say ghost recon or rainbow six or whatever. If we have a real world game with just humans in it, then we can more easily limit the player for where and how he moves. But in a superhero game, we, that's not so easy. So Again, we need to be thinking about stuff like that and be understanding like what are we comfortable with? Because even stuff like water, like water to me is always this like this weird thing of like, you know, even for myself, like I'm not the best swimmer in the world, but I, I'm a decent swimmer. And um, so when I get to, you know, when I get in and I'm playing a game and I get to like a river and suddenly it's like, urch, hard wall, can't go past it. The river's like, two feet wide, I can't jump over it, you know, it's like six inches deep and I can't go through it and there's just like this artificial boundary there and like, yeah, I get it, it's a game and you're trying to stop me and all that but, you know, come on, like, the, you know, I, my suspension of disbelief only goes so far and so you got to be careful and sensitive towards that, right? And that's something that you need to, to be aware of um, that that is important for you to do and um, one second... And, um, so, you know, the, um, so again, I, I'm trying to get you to kind of see how when you're designing these things, you need to be, you need to be able to understand, like, what do you want in a level? Like, you know, and again, if I'm going to be designing a real world-ish city and I want to build a control where my characters go, because I don't want to have to necessarily build out a massive open world and even an open world at some point has an edge. You know, there's still something there. And so I've got to be thinking about these things and how am I going to stop the player, you know, and, and not make it too fake and too artificial. So that's the kind of stuff where then I might have to be jumping back up into, you know, movement again. And so then it's kind of like, you know, what are we, what are we going to allow and what are we going to have, you know, and, and so, so we may jump back and forth between these things right to understand like like even even a simple even a thing as simple as movement what i'm trying to show you is how complicated it is um it's very 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 easy just to be like ah it's just movement like you know press on the left analog stick and my character you know moves through the world done right like it's designed and you're like no 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 like ed edge cases you know and this is just movement and exploration throughout a world and, and we haven't even gotten into combat yet Right. And now combat movement is a whole nother thing. So now, now we might start going like, okay, well, what kinds of things now? So now we might want to come down into combat and we might say, you know, um, um, so, you know, so now, Again, asking myself more questions. So, so that first scenario was me thinking about um, how you know how a generalized movement system that, I, that I'll put in the category of exploration, how that sort of works, you know. And then I'm thinking about the levels and like, okay, how's that going to work in the particular level, and how's that going to look in the level, and how big the level needs to be, and what kind of game and level is, is that working? But then the next layer layer of complication is combat. Like, how am I going to move in combat, right? And do I have, you know, moving attacks? And do I have, you know, other kinds of things? Um, um, you know, and so you can see that I'm, I'm asking initially a lot of questions. And, and 
some of these I need to answer now. Some of them I don't, but but I'm just I'm thinking through the process, right? And and so again, as part of the brainstorming things here, I, you know, I may, you know, even in my working documents, I mean, I'm I'm typing these out right now to show you guys how I'm thinking and and how that's working for me. But I want you to also to kind of see that that um, that by doing that, um, you know, and by by thinking through these things. Now it's just asking a lot of questions and that's, you know, and so it comes back to why again, you know, and you'll hear me again, I'll, I'll repeat this over and over and over again, the silly thing of ask why, right? And it's amazing how often we don't ask ourselves these things. Why do we do this? Why do we do that and stuff? And like, how does this, you know, how does this affect us? Right? And so, um, um, so for example, you know, the old exploding barrels that, you know, been around since doom, you know, um, you know, you know, you know, so in this case, maybe it's vehicles, maybe it's whatever, certain things, you know, um, so, you know, physics, destruction, destructibles, um, I'll say, um, so, you know, objects that I can use. So you'll, you'll see this in, in like some superhero movies where somebody really strong, you know, rips a telephone pole out of the ground or a light pole or whatever, and it just becomes a big baseball bat. Right. And they're just clearing enemies, you know, swinging, you know, this object in the world, right? Like that, you know, that could be something that's done or, you know, or they pick up, you know, it could be something like this. It could be something, you know, massive, but they pick up something and they throw it, you know, as a weapon, right? Um, so, like, those kinds of things are, are questions about, again, in a superhero game, you want to sell, you know, and this comes back to the IP and the brand, right? And this comes back to the the, the core of really what we do as game designers. And, and, and I'll talk about this just for a second, you know, without reiterating too heavily on it, but... But what we're trying to do is, is sell a fantasy, right? Players are going into this because for this brief moment in time that they're playing your game, they want to be somebody else. They want to, you know, do something that they can't do in normal life most of the time. You know, and that's a lot, not all of, but, but a lot of the players that play games, that's what they're after. They're fan, they're in this fantasy fulfillment. They want to be a superhero for a day. They want to be a special forces soldier for a day, right? They want to do, you know, they want to go to space. They want to kill aliens. They want to save the planet, right? These are fantasies that people like to fulfill. And the reason we like it in games is that it's active. We can do it, right? We can be that guy that saves the world. We can be the guy that, that goes out, you know, and, and is the hero and, you know, and is brave and, you know, and, and can pick up a gun and use it in, you know, and whatever, right? Or, you know, it could be the opposite. I want to be the bad guy. Like, I'm, you know, I might be a cop by day, but, you know, there's times where I might be like, you know, I just kind of want to be the, the gangbanger tonight. And I want to go off and just, like, kill people and be a bad guy. And that's my fantasy, right? Because I have to be the good guy all day in real life, right? So whatever that case is, without judging anybody, you have to understand, like, why are people going to want to play your game? Right. And what's that fantasy that you're fulfilling for them? And how do you deepen that fantasy? Right. And so that's where, again, while these systems all sound really simple, you know, and, and, and basic, but really part of what you have to keep asking yourself over and over again is, does this fulfill the player's fantasy? Right. Is this something that the, that the player is going to be like, yes, I feel powerful. Like, right. I feel, you know, that I'm a superhero. I feel like I saved the world because I was smart, because I was better, you know, because I had skills or whatever it is. But, but how did I feel better about this thing? Right. And so, um, so that's something that you need to be thinking about. And that's where some of these things come from, you know, that the player's fantasies and things like that often come from movies or other things where, you know, so, so your inspiration as a game designer often needs to come from not necessarily the real world, but, but even the, the Hollywoodized version of that experience, right? And, the, and, um, one last quick note on that is, is remember that 
quite often these days, the Hollywood version of things is often really what people expect, not the real version of things. And so this, this is especially true in like, say modern military type stuff or in, um, or this can be true in, you know, in other kinds of, um, you know, like historical stuff or whatever. And that, you know, there could be a movie about something that's completely false, you know, but, but they portray it as kind of like this was, this happened in the real world. Um, but you know, in reality, that stuff didn't actually happen that way, you know? And so now, but, but people didn't read the book, didn't do the research. They just saw the movie and they expected that's the, that's what the fantasy is to them is that what that movie is selling, not necessarily the truth and reality of it. Um, and, um, and in fact, you know, you have to be careful, especially if you're doing simulation games, um, that that can be problematic as well. Um, I know that I was talking the other day with Scott Bayless, who's one of our mentors. Um, Scott was my boss for a while at Microsoft, and he's been in the industry about 35 years, I think, or more. Um, and um, amazing guy with a lot of experience. I remember that he was working on a... A uh, game way back when that was a uh, World War Two or World War One or Two, I can't remember now. Um, basically, a flight simulation game. I think it was called Red Baron, if I remember right. Uh, don't quote me on that one. Um, and you know, they they were simulating the kind of the Western Front, you know, and how often you know battles would come up in that game, you know, and they made it very realistic. And then they wondered why when people were playing the game, they could never find fights, you know, and then they could never find enemy, you know, enemy planes to fight fly you know or to fight and it was the game was really really boring when they were testing it and you know and but the reality was when they actually did the research and realized that that you know i think if i remember the number correctly only like one in ten sorties one in ten flights actually like encountered a bad guy like you didn't go find a bad guy flying a plane in every single flight you took it was just like one in ten maybe you found somebody to fight against so 90 percent of the time you just kind of flew around and patrolled and you actually didn't find you know somebody else there to fly against so when they tried to simulate reality that really wasn't fun so they had to like you know accelerate that because you wanted to find bad guys every time you went out so so you had to realize what was real what was simulation and how to make something fun and and get the fantasy across but still not get so realistic about it that you know that you that you had to get all kind of OCD, right? So just be be kind of aware of that. Yeah, so Big Lob. Yeah, the Avengers game, this is um, a challenge with any licensed IP. Um, in the case of the Avengers game, um, I'm 99% sure, and I don't know firsthand, but I would I'm guessing through experience here. That um, quite often the reason that the characters did not look like the actual characters in the movies is that those characters in the movies are actual real human beings, mostly. Some of them are CG, but um, but for the most part, those characters are are based off a real human being. And the short of it is, is that each each character um, usually in most contracts. So now let's talk about the legal side of that for a second. The reason that that um, you know they didn't do it is they would actually have to pay that actor the what we call image and likeness rights, and so so sometimes occasionally a movie is is and the, the movie studio is really smart and they will do contracts with their um, people that basically say like okay if you sign up for this movie and we pay you for this movie we own your image and likeness we can reuse it in games and anything else and we can do whatever we want to do with it. You know, it's basically ours and we don't owe you anything for the rest of your life. And that's just the way the contract is. But some actors are like, no, we're not we're not signing that contract. Right. Like, so if you want to use us in the future, then, you know, um, you got to pay us. Right. And so and that's the, that's one of the biggest challenges with movie license games in general is that quite often a lot of the additional content and that can include the music, um, you know, and stuff. um is all owned by somebody else. They're owned by the artists, the actors, or somebody. Somebody, and so the mo- the movie studios might own the name Avengers. They might own the story. They might own other things, but they don't own the the image and right likeness rights for the particular actor. And so that's where you know Crystal Dynamics and the, the developers were purposely had to diverge, you know, in order to not step on the toes of. Of that, so they, so Marvel or somebody might give them the the rights to say like, yes, you can do this character, 
but you've got to make a new version of them that looks a little bit different. And so now to your point, which is, which is great. So suddenly now my, my suspension of disbelief and my fantasy fulfillment became a little bit less because I'm like, yeah, I'm Spider-Man, I guess, but now which version of him am I? And now I'm kind of confused. Like Spidey's actually kind of a good example that I think he's been around long enough. Um, Superman, some of those, um, especially ones where you really see their face a lot or whatever, but they've gone through so many iterations that you're kind of like, which one is it? And like, which fantasy am I living now? And it can get like a little bit strange sometimes, a little bit hard, you know, to do that. And then other brands don't necessarily care. I, I personally even get, get screwed up watching certain, um, TV shows or certain things. Um, I think the one that messed me up the worst was like Battlestar Galactica, you know, and I love Battlestar Galactica, the, the 1970s version, you know, and then the, the 84 remake was okay, but I was a huge, huge, huge fan of like the original Battlestar Galactica. And then when they redid Galactica, um, you know, whatever it was, you know, 10 years ago or whatever it was, um, they, um, they had a lot of characters in there that they changed from like men to women, you know, um, people like Boomer, you know, went from a man to a woman and Apollo went from a man to a woman. So the character names were the same, but they changed genders, you know, as well as like other things. And I just, it was so hard for me to wrap my head around like that. That was Starbuck and Apollo and, you know, and they, they changed so much in it that I just, I, I couldn't get my head around it. And I, I always, was rubbed wrong a little bit there, you know, that it took me a long time to really understand that, accept it because it just, it changed so much from what I was used to. Right. And so it doesn't mean that it was bad. And in fact, the, the new Galactico from a, from a perspective of just quality was amazing, you know? And so I really, really liked what they did with the series, but to your point, like even those extreme examples, like a lot of people are remaking things now and they're changing you know, the nationalities of characters or changing them from men to women or whatever that is to make them more broadly appealing, which is great, but it can really like mess with people who are really hardcore fans of something. So that is definitely something you have to take into account. So, um, so I'm trying to just today focus on, I think movement. Um, again, we'll see next week if we, if we want to keep going on this and I apologize. This is, this is getting to, um, um, little too detailed or, or whatever, but hopefully you guys are, are appreciating where I'm trying to show again, how just in this one, this is only one of hundreds of systems, um, that potentially, um, you know, that, that can go into the game, you know, and, um, and so, you know, we just have to be careful, right? We, we have to kind of understand that all these things are kind of related. And, and again, like movement again, like thinking about the IP, we're making superheroes. We're making our own superhero game, right? What do we want these superheroes to be, right? What do we want them to do? Um, and, you know, and things like that. And so, like, even here, like, let's go back up to, um, in fact, I'm going to make this really quick. Just, let's see, this is heading to, just so I can more easily jump down here really quick. Um, I'm just going to put this to heading three, just so it shows up here really quick. Um, ah. Okay. All right. So I'm just doing that just so I can, I can more easily jump around here. So like um, player movement, you know, now we might also be wanting to think about, again, you know, so what stops players physically, you know, um, I, and then, um, So the, re the reason I am 
bringing this up and you can see again just trying to show you how i will bounce around sometimes between two three four headings and also quite often i will again i mentioned this i will have the same document open quite often in two or three windows and i instead of jumping around in one doc like i'm doing here i'll just literally have each section open in a different window because i've got my nice big monitor here you know and that way I can just like quickly just go between different parts of my document without having to like take the time even to scroll back and forth to be more efficient there, right? Um, but my point of what I'm trying to, to, to show you in this one thing with movement and, and why limiters is part of that is, is important to understand is that this comes back to my brand. This comes back to my IP. This comes back to who are my superheroes, right? And, and this is a really important question. Like, how do I differentiate these guys? How do I differentiate this stuff? And so, you know, I've used the word magic, you know, a few times because, you know, that is a an analogy of superhero power that we can use, that we kind of understand as a magic system. Like, what whether we want to call it, you know, um, and I'll even put it here, you know, and I'll put it in quotes just to remind us. Um, but, like, do we want to limit people, limit our characters or not? And so, so from a brand and an IP perspective, there's times and places where we don't want that. But in the same hand, from a game, we need to sometimes because that's what makes the game fun. That's what makes it controlled. And if, and if the players like take Superman again, you know, and I'm using extreme examples, you know, for reason, but like if I could just fly around the world a thousand times, then there's no restrictions, then like, you know, that whole, you know, I have no way of stopping you, right? I have no way of controlling you. But if if we use the analogy of of magic, and, I'm, and again, I'm using this word magic to just kind of be a way of understanding superpowers, whatever whatever makes it as far as our brand again is our IP. Like, do we want to limit ourselves or not? And is that interesting? Um, and, and so, so this question is kind of bigger than we, we sometimes realize it's, it's about the gameplay systems being fun, but also it was like, is this like cool within our brand and our universe? So, so, you know, any of you that have played, you know, any fantasy, you know, D and D to fantasy games these days, you know, whatever percentage, whether it's a hundred percent of them or a vast majority of them all have this concept of, of like say mana. Right. And go play Diablo or go play, you know, lots of, you know, games where I have a, a meter and a bar for my mana, which is my magical energy. Right. And so every ability that I use, I can cast spells, I can heal people, I can do things as a magician. Right. And each, each of those things takes away from that mana, right? It might be, you know, that healing somebody might take 10 points, certain attacks might take 20, a super attack takes 100, you know, and some things can be damaged, you know, could be over time. So like, it might be like a, the equivalent of like a flamethrower where I'm like, <sighs> like this. And so it's taking away one point per second versus a, a block of points. There's lots and lots of ways of degrading energy, right? Now, where this becomes interesting and fun to me or, or could be part of the brand that I'm trying to build. And this is, this is again, a bigger problem. Um, but, and this is where this limiter is kind of important, but it's, but it's related, right? In that if I have super speed, if I have teleporting, if I have, you know, any of these extreme abilities, um, flying or whatever, maybe I do want to limit them for the sake of my gameplay and controlling my games, controlling my levels. And therefore, if all that stuff takes energy, and I'll, and I, whatever its name is going to be, energy, mana, whatever, um, then, you know, then, and then that energy might, in some cases, um, recharge slowly over time, um, or it might require me to have a, a substance, um, you know, or something that I drink or something that I take, you know, that, you know, like, you know, in, in Diablo, you've got to drink your little, um, potions, you know, that give you back more mana, right? And that's the way you got more energy and you could keep casting more magic spells um, if you needed it quickly. And so so in a superhero game, you have like kind of that same problem where you're like hyper overpowered or you could be. Um, and if you don't limit them, then like, you know, I don't want to just be able to like, you know, snap, you're dead, you're dead and you're dead. And yeah, you're dead too. Like, you know, if it's that easy. Then 
why am I playing, right? There, there has to be, in a superhero game, there still has to be some limits, right? But this goes back to the brand. And so controlling our movement and controlling how much and how fast and how often and all these kinds of things is a big part of what's going to make this game kind of interesting and fun and make it playable and balanced. Um, but it's a big part of the brand identity, right? And so that's where, again, we can't get... We don't want to go too far down this rail of understanding these things in a superhero game because of that challenge. And so, so keep that in mind there in that th these things, um, so I'll just put another big note. Okay, not smelling well today. Um, so I just want you guys to kind of see where where and why and how I'm bouncing between all these things, right? Because they, they're all really interrelated and you're, you're kind of working on a bunch of stuff kind of together. Hi, Megan, how are you? So, and could we possibly do a selection of Supermans or Spider-Mans that look like different versions of or like different skins? Um, yeah, so like, you know, in developing a superhero game, um, one of our conditions was that we wanted to create a new universe, right? We wanted to go through the exercise. We're not going to use a licensed game here. Now, do we want to create and recreate, you know, what do we call him? Superboy. You know, I don't know what name is, is, is not been licensed. You know, let's just assume the name Superboy or whatever, um, super person, you know, has not been, you know, taken, um, you know, and now we, we create a guy who's in a blue suit with a, you know, purple cape and, you know, he's got blonde hair and he's Asian, you know, or, or something, right? So he, he visually looks different, but now he's got, you know, most or all of the same abilities. He's got freezing eyes instead of, you know, instead of laser melting eyes and he's got fire breath instead of like whatever, but, you know, but kind of Superman, right? Like it's an obvious one that you're you're kind of ripping it off. Um, same with Spider-Man. Um, yes, I mean technically and legally, you can create those things. Um, you, you do need to be very, very, very careful. Um, anytime you are blatantly copying something, you know, and it's pretty obvious that's what you're copying, um, you could face legal issues. Um, and you know, do you really want you know Marvel or DC, i.e. Disney? you know, or Warner Brothers um, coming after you, right? And that's, so like, you got to be very careful there because again, some of that stuff done in parody, you know, is is okay, you know, but if you're really making kind of a competitive product or whatever, you do got to be really careful about, you know, um, just making them look different. Um, and that's all that it is, but it's basically pretty obvious to anybody that plays it that that's who that person really is. Um, and so, um, but it, it is hard because especially in the, in the super person ish universes, you know, if you take all the different superheroes that have existed over time, you know, in every movie game and everything that's ever existed, it's pretty darn hard to come up with anything original these days. Um, and so that's where it gets challenging. Now, one of the, the workarounds to some of that could be that allowing the players to create their own superheroes. And, and allowing them to um, to um, customize their own people, then you know, as long as those aren't like our like front of the box, our poster kind of characters that are going to be our key signature characters that we're promoting. Uh, but if somebody can can build a Superman looking ish kind of character with similar skills and abilities, you know, do we need to limit that and stop that? Like that's players doing what they want to do with it and that can be maybe okay but I'd still run it past my legal department and make sure that that legally I can I think by the letter of the law it's a technically around 20% if you change anything more than about 20% is kind of the number that the legally you can get away with it but that doesn't stop somebody from like Disney or big companies from suing you and just making your life hell and expensive and so that's where you kind of have to understand, is it morally right? Is it legally okay? Should we, could we, and, you know, and all that. So, so be careful whenever you're creating these things to, to about what you're copying versus what you're making original. And it's, and again, it's hard because, you know, 
I know that certain people um, have brought this up, you know, a couple episodes ago um, on the show where they talked about, well, they, um, um, you know, why not just use a Marvel or DC or whatever, you know, because obviously it's more recognizable and, and has more fan fulfillment, you know, more fantasy fulfillment and stuff. But again, for the exercise of what we're doing in this, because we're world building, um, we definitely don't want to do that. And I, I don't want to right now take on the the complexities of licensing um the costs especially in licensing and you know and then all the approvals and the processes and all those kinds of things um to me are not things that i necessarily want to take on um in that and so just be careful like like a a superhero IP and license can be great because it's like, oh, I got a nice box to work in and here's all my guys and they're predefined and whatever. But you're like, okay, but what happens when I need to do something else that's not, that that character can't do and now I'm stuck and now I have to kind of contrive my way through it. And so I think that was the trouble. I I have not yet played the Avengers game. That's actually on my list. I probably should have done before I even started this whole um, exercise. But um, but I think that's that's where some of that can devolve, and that you you know people have specific powers, and you got to live within that. So now I've got to define levels and things that that are you know that utilize those exactly, right? Um, and actually, that's that's another thing here to keep in mind um, is let's see. Um, So, actually, I'm going to put this up here just for now. Um, and um, because this is a this is a bigger a bigger problem that again we need to kind of address here, and I'll even highlight it just to kind of again call it out. Um, so one of the other problems in, in relationship to game system design and in level design, um, and the, um, in fact, actually, just to make this even clearer, I'm going to drop this down into, let's see, levels. Because this is really like um, a, a level a level problem here. And so what, you know, what does this mean, right? Well, you know, now we're talking about, let's just, again, devolve this back to movement because we're talking about movement. So let's just say that we are designing a level and we are anticipating that the player is going to have flying, right? And so now let's say we've got some tall buildings and, you know, and there's something on top of a tall building that we need and we just assume that the player can fly up there and grab it and then come back down and he's got it. And so, you know, problem solved. Well, you know, if the player is... Um, if the player is capable of having, you know, any characters in, in his team, maybe he chose a selection of characters that doesn't have flying, right? So now can he get past a particular level? Can he get past a certain enemy, a certain boss? Um, and so that becomes where the design of these types of games, um, why sometimes things get a little bit more generic, I guess, and maybe not quite as interesting sometimes is when you allow an almost unlimited number of options, when you have collection, you know, and I, and I mean collection by like, I can collect and get lots of characters, right? And with lots of different skills and abilities, lots of different character classes, character types, you know, those kinds of things, right? When I, when I allow that in my game, right? Now, I don't know the combination the player is gonna have, right? And so think about this in terms of, you know, for those of you that play MMORPGs or, or RPGs, you know, and we've got the, the Holy Trinity, right? We've got, you know, tanks, you know, and DPS and support, you know, it's kind of the three character classes. And, and generally, like if I'm going to go do a raid or something like that, right? Like I need, you know, I might have a four person, five person raid. And so I know that like, okay, I need to go in with two DPS one tank and one healer, for example. And if I don't have that combination, I probably can't get through this particular battle. But, you know, in the single player game for now and, and in that combination of stuff, 
again, like what happens when I, if, if I create some weird combination, if I go into this mission and go into this thing, you know, in, in this level or whatever we want to call it with some combination thereof that doesn't exist, um, what do I do? Do I get stuck? Do I just fail and then I have to replay the whole thing? Um, can I swap out characters mid battle, you know, and mid mission? So, you know, I'm like, crap, I need somebody that can fly or I need somebody that can heal. So maybe there's a cost involved or like something, but maybe, you know, my spaceship can drop off. You know, we, we talked about bases and one of the things I wanted there was maybe the ability to, to swap things out, right? Because that could then like, oh, okay, I don't have underwater swimming with this character, you know, with this guys, but then, you know, I go into this level and if I don't have underwater swimming, I'm screwed. You know, like, like, what do I do? Right. And so, so there's just things like that, that, that we need to be aware of. And then even the way that we like unlock new missions and things could take some of that into account. So let's, let's say we have the ability talking about like underwater stuff. Cause that's a, another extreme that, um, I, you know, I could see where not every superhero can swim or, you know, I don't know that I've ever seen Superman's, you know, underwater, right? Like that's not what he does. Um, not to say that he ha hasn't gone underwater, but that's just, you don't see him like swimming underwater, right? Um, so in this case, let's just say we have, um, Aquaman, you know, or some character that can swim underwater. Um, and so we might have specific missions that unlock now that, don't unlock and don't become available until we have a particular character. And so we might build missions in that require that character. And then depending on how we're building our levels, you know, is it open world? Is it closed world? You know, are we, are we starting missions and we get to go into, you know, um, the start of a mission and we can build out our loadout of like, okay, we're going to select which four characters we're bringing. Maybe we get four backup characters who can come in, um, at any time. We get the loadouts of the characters, you know, maybe we get some gear and equipment, some vehicles, whatever it is on our pre, pre mission screen. And then when we hit start, then we go in with, with all of this stuff, right? And that's what we get to play with when we're in these levels. Um, and if that's the case, then we could also do things where if I know that I need to have a specific type of character or whatever, like Aquaman, then maybe some of these things are pre-configured into a slot that we can't change, right? Or highly recommended or whatever, something that gives the player information that, that he's going to need this thing, whether it's for movement or, or something else, right? So... So that there, there is some design solutions again, but again, you can see we're hitting edge cases. We're hitting edge cases and edge cases, you know, of all these kinds of things. And like, how do we deal with that? Right. Um, now jumping back up really quick here to combat. So again, like th there's a lot of things with movement and combat, right? And we need to be understanding there's that there's the second to second kinds of stuff, you know, and, you know, and, and how like, you know, can we run and we jump and we, you know, we, had, we attack that way, you know, can we do like super fast attacks, you know, that might run into something or, you know, like, uh, you know, they I think the incredible Hulk or other characters, um, you know, do like running smash, you know, just run into things and then smash it and send it flying, you know, with, with physics, you know, and stuff. Right. Um, and, um, um, let's see, you know, you know, the, um, so there's, there's a wide variety of ways that movement and combat are also related. Right. And so, so the, um, um, You know, so again, you know, like in some cases, you know, especially like like RTSs or whatever, right? You you got a river and you got a bridge across, and you're like you got to get across that bridge, but there's a choke point, you know, and there's a bunch of enemies on the other side, and they've got defenses, and they're like you know, you're really struggling to kind of get through that, you know, make that happen, you know, and and whatnot. The same could be like I've got a city street and I'm coming down the city street, and my four guys are there. But, you know, at some point there's a bunch of tanks and there's a bunch of other weapons and there's all this stuff. And it's kind of like, I got to, the only path is down that street. Like I got to get through that barricade, that blockade, you know, and how am I going to do that? Right. They're stopping my movement. Um, or are they 
right? Can I jump over them? You know, can I, you know, fly over them? Can I, you know, burrow under them? You know, whatever the thing is, right? Like, what is that superhero power, um, you know, and, and how's that sort of work, right? And so that's how even in combat, um, there's the second to second movement of like when I'm physically fighting with somebody, whether it's in melee or using weapons or whatever special abilities I've got. And then there's the like, oh, like the positioning, you know, and that tactical positioning of like where I am. So there's, um, you know, and then, um, um, So, again, I'm not, since we're, we're just about out of time here, I'm not getting into that whole thing, but I'm just trying to kind of show you, you know, again, you know, and then let's see real quick before I forget. So there's a whole other thing here real quick. of just like, again, whether this is done in, in combat or whether this is done in, you know, in levels, but again, um, um, just add this here really quick. Um, um, so the, um, so again, this is where, you know, combinations of things now as we start to deepen this and we start to get even more complicated and whatever, right? Like, so now how do my four characters now work together as a team, you know, um, you know, um, you know, pick up and throw another character somewhere, right? Like, Hulk or somebody really strong, like, you know, throws somebody and, you know, sends them flying up and over, you know, something possibly. Um, and, um, you know, there, there's lots of ways that, again, as team members, you can have a whole nother set of skills and abilities related to that team, right? And that team working together. Um, and so I'm not even going to get into that, but I'm just trying to show you just in movement alone, you know, we've got base movement abilities, um, being able to, you know, do all these different types of things that would be done, be doing in movement. We've got to worry about like who's on camera, who's not on camera. What happens is the camera is zooming in and out as we're moving our team around and we're, and we're, and we're doing things there. We're worrying about how big the space is, you know, and how fast and, and how big things are and how that affects, you know, how densely populated, you know, stuff can be. Um, you know, the types of weapons, the types of attacks. Um, movement attacks and movement related to attacks. Um, and again, this can get complicated because it's like, okay, if there's, again, somebody who's being very defensive and they're in a bunker and they're, you know, like supposed to be really hard to kill and I've got some superhero that can just take them out like that, you know, then like, you know, the, the range of my weapons, we haven't even gotten into like the whole another level that's related to movement, which would be like, okay, now I've got a bunch of weapons, you know, that might have, range they might have lobbying they might have you know whatever it is right and and so now my rate of movement or where and how i move can also be related to my weapons um and so for example you know i might have like say a big chasm right where the, the earth opens up and there's a big tunnel or a big hole in the ground right and so and maybe we decide we can't jump it we can't fly over it we limit the superheroes on their movement to control them so now like I'm on one side, my characters are on one side, there's a big gap, and the enemies are over here, and we think like, aha, we, you know, we've got you separated, so now you can't run up and do a melee attack. But now, you know, some guy's got a long range attack, so he just sits back and snipes and kills everybody on the other side, and, you know, so just because he couldn't move over that barrier doesn't necessarily mean that he can't attack over that barrier. Um, so a hole in the ground or water or things like that up to a certain distance, if your weapons can pass that distance, like the equivalent of a sniper rifle, um, you know, 
then you know you have to make sure that, that your enemies are that distance and a little bit more so that they can't be taken out by a weapon, right? And so there's just all these layers of complications that suddenly start affecting how your level's designed and how you know how and where you can move to with your abilities. And so we haven't even, like I said, gotten into how all this interrelates to combat and special abilities, but I want you to kind of see how they're all kind of related, right? And you, you can't go down and design one thing in too, you know, in too much detail, right? Without understanding the bigger picture. So we've got three more minutes left. Um, does anybody have any questions? I hope that you guys are still awake and this was um, useful. I know we kind of deep dived in just this one area, but I felt like this was where we could get the most synergies for trying to see how all these things are kind of working together, um, you know, in, in a wide variety of ways. And we only like, tip of the iceberg touched on a bunch of these interrelated, you know, things about how you have to be thinking through a bunch of interrelated gameplay systems um, and, you know, and how to make them all work together. Right. And, and just even something as simple as we think is movement can get incredibly deep and incredibly complicated very, very, very quickly if we don't make the right choices. Right. And so there's not right or wrongs here, guys. This is not about like, the, you know, I can't tell you that this is the um, um, th this is the way to do it. Right. The, 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 the process is like, what do I as a game designer think is fun? Right. What do I think I want the user experience to be? Right. And and stuff. And so so that you, know, you just need to be able to, to kind of just be aware of those things. So anyways. Good, Luke. I'm glad that's making sense and, and you're seeing that process. Um, again, it's it's hard in such a short period of time sometimes to to go through and kind of try to move this from just pure theory into like this practicality, right? Of like, how do we apply this, you know, and how do we use this? Um, and so I hope that um, this is helping everybody just to kind of get that sense for, again, how do I sit here? and design these things, right? How do I think through these different systems? And you can see that even movement, and we didn't cover all aspects of movement today. I mean, we just touched on a few of them, but it's, you know, it's affecting my brand. It's affecting my minute to minute gameplay. It's affecting my combat. It affects how I build my levels, right? And like, and so many other things, you know? And so, and that's only one system of many. So just keep that in mind. It's, it's, it's very complicated and just requires a lot of thinking. And again, put yourself in the player's perspective and understand what their experience is going to be. All right. So thank you all again for, for joining me and hopefully um, this helped you guys again. We'll, we'll see next week if we're going to keep going on this um, or if we're going to move on to something else. Um, but I hope this um, again, gave you a better sense just for, you know, again, how to design, you know, systems when you're actually going through a document and trying to design them. So have a great week, everybody. Be safe, and we will see you all next week. So take care, and thanks again. Bye now.